All right, guys, welcome back to another episode of This Week in Photo. I'm your host, Frederick Van Johnson. Today I'm joined by Mr. Martin Bailey from Martin Bailey Photography and Mr. Dan Ablin from AGA Digital Studies in the Windy City, also known as Chicago. Hey, gentlemen, how are you? Good, how are you? I'm good, I'm good. As we were discussing before I press record, uh, it's been a day of angst with technology again. Thank you, Google. <laughs> and I'm tempting the fates. I'm tempting the fates by criticizing Google at the beginning of a hangout. <laughs> it's like that one time it didn't record at all, remember? I know. It's done it a couple times. It's a couple times. All right, let's see if we can get through this one with no, with no craziness. But, you know, all kidding aside, being able to do a hangout podcast this way, there's, there's no better way to do it. It's just... Yeah. It's just, you know, I call it digital sharecropping, you know. <laughs> when, the, when the landowner wants you to plant potatoes, you got to plant potatoes. <laughs> All right, guys. Um, this is going to be an interesting show. So, as you guys know, you may or may not know, I think both of you guys are in the know on this. Today was Apple's day or one of Apple's day. Today was the first day of WWDC 2016 their worldwide developers conference and they use that as a platform to talk about kind of mid-year releases and announcements and updates to software and all that. Um, today was no different. They announced a couple things. Some of the highlights that we're going to talk about on this show are they updated watchOS, which is the operating system, obviously, that runs on the Apple Watches. OS X uh, is now becoming Mac OS with this re this next release is going to be codenamed Sierra. So Mac OS Sierra is the next release, and then they made a bunch of announcements to iOS 10 and some interesting things that are happening happening with Photos, which are particularly pertinent to this show. Martin Bailey, did you see the keynote? I know it's early there. Have you had time? No, I haven't had time to look at it yet. I'll check it out later, but it's it's interesting stuff. Let me let me share let me save you some time. So this <laughs> there wasn't a whole lot announced. <laughs> so a lot because people were expecting I mean, we were people, myself included, were expecting some new hardware and some other things. They made a a ton of announcements, some cool stuff that I've been waiting on, like some some home kit stuff for for uh the home automation type things. So a lot of that stuff came out. But it was a it, to me, there's a lot, a fair amount of fluff in this one. You know, there was zero mm -hmm. hardware announcements. It's all software, mm -hmm. which makes sense for a developer's conference. But at the same time, you know, we wanted to see some new Macs or some new phones or some new watches mm -hmm. or something like that. When you saw this sort of rundown, Martin, in, in the show notes and in your own research, was there anything that stood out that you thought was particularly exciting? Um, partly, I mean, I was, I was hoping for a new 13-inch MacBook Pro Retina um, because I, you know, the, my my new lightweight kit, which is not mirrorless or anything like that, but the number of lenses I carry now has enabled me to carry a smaller bag. Nice. And it's got a 13-inch laptop compartment in the back. So I could travel with one bag instead of a second, um, a second bag. Yeah. I was hoping for a new 13-inch um, ret Retina MacBook, but um, that didn't, didn't come out. So little bit disappointed there, but the rest of the stuff, you know, I, I, I'm actually quite enjoying using the Photos app um, yeah, on, the, really? on Mac OS. Yeah, and it's, you know, the OS 10, the iOS um, 10 has got some, looking at the, the notes here, got some cool stuff there. They're, they're adding stuff to a map. Um, mm -hmm. I, I actually, I really enjoy having my, uh, my images in an application where I can quickly put them onto a map. Um, Especially when I'm traveling in countries, say I'm, I'm running a tour somewhere where I've not I've not been um, more than a few times, and and if I've got a driver that doesn't know the roads, I have to tell him where to go, and it's it's really invaluable for me to be able to get up a map of previous trips and see exactly where we shot which photos, and then guide someone back to it. So maps, photos on maps to me is really um, really valuable. Um, other stuff, yeah, I mean. On the on the the desktop side, Siri on the desktop. That's that's going to be fun. Yeah. Um, I I'm think I'm wondering. You know, I mean, you I don't want to have this mic set up to run all the time just for Siri. Right. So I'm I'm wondering what that what's going to happen there. Probably need some small small microphone that just plugs in or something, yeah. um, rather than something, having a full something mic. Something tells me something tells me. You know, thinking trying to put myself in an, in Apple's 
you know, in their chair. This release seems a whole lot like it was laying the groundwork for some some new hardware that's coming mm. next, right? Mm. Like all this Siri stuff, all this this HomeKit stuff, all that stuff seems like they're just. You know, there you could you could almost feel it during the keynote that they're like right. holding back on. Well, we're gonna be talking about that, but we're talking about this right now. Yeah. Dan, Dan, so I think on a previous show, maybe even the last show, if um, we talked about machine learning, and I was I went on this rant about, hey, I, how come I can't talk to my Mac and say, show me you. all the yeah, show me all the photos that I took in Chicago last weekend. Boom, and now it's coming. Yeah. Obviously, in this next release, is that is that a feature that you're looking forward to? You know, I I never even thought about it to be honest. Um, so you had mentioned it, um, but it's interesting if you look if you look at the track record, what they were doing. You know, you had iOS separate, and you had the operating system, and then they were incorporating more of these things into here with photos, and then the photos are now coming into here and Siri, and you know they're making each of them as close as possible. Um, I think you know with all these apps because. In this past year, I too have been using the the Photos app for a lot more. Um, it's actually really convenient because I remember, God, there was an app years ago, um, which Photos is just like now. And I can't remember what it was. Aperture. It was back are, when you, are you thinking of Aperture? <laughs> What's that? <laughs> aperture? No, not Aperture. Um, uh, Picasa. Oh yeah, from, from Google. Google. Yeah. Yeah, I love that, and so and that's kind of what Photos is like now. Um, you know, Google bought it. I'm sure they still have it. I, I don't know if anybody uses yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, they're they're folding it into into Google Photos and all that. Yeah, and so in this past year, we've just kind of separated our family iCloud accounts. Everybody has their own. Um, you know, everything's just sinking. I don't even worry about it anymore with Photos, and it's it's uh, it's really convenient. Yeah. Really, so okay, I, I like need to get going with everything. And and you know me, I'm a software junkie, so little usability things that change, you know, I'll mm -hmm. geek out on those. So yeah. I did want more hardware too. Would have been nice to upgrade the uh, MacBook Pro, which is my main computer now. Um, but it's <laughs> it's still two years old and it's doing just fine. But yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. I think even if they had upgraded the you know issue, you know, release new Macs or iMacs or whatever. I wouldn't have bought one because I'm still very happy with my with my Mac, you know, and my MacBook Pro 13. I'm I'm happy with them. So yeah. I don't really I'm not like oh they have to update this stuff because my computers suck. My computers are great <laughs> right now. <laughs> Everything's great. The only thing that I would put in the borderline suckage category would be the <laughs> the poor. That should be the title of this show. Uh, <laughs> Would be the performance of my watch, you know. The Apple Watch is great for what it does, but it's like the 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 lag time for launching apps and the responsiveness and the ippiness of Siri on the watch. It's like it doesn't live up to the Apple promise of what this this watch world would be. So that will be the next version. Yeah, which It'll they said in the keynote. Honestly, why I didn't I didn't buy one? Yeah, you know, it'd be cool to have, but it's like for the money. It's like you know what. Next version will be a little better, a little thinner. Always, yeah. Well, well, Watch OS three, as they demoed in the keynote mm -hmm. today, um, has a, a bunch of cool new features in there. And the first first feature they demoed was, hey, look, look how fast things launch. <laughs> because clearly, I'm not the only one that's like, you know, I'm I can't really use any of the apps. You know, even even setting a timer. So like in my kitchen when I'm cooking. I'll set a timer, and it's easier for me, literally, it's easier for me to reach for the little timer that's magnetically stuck to the refrigerator and turn that <laughs> to 10 minutes, or tell the the Amazon Echo device to set a timer for 10 minutes than to tell my watch, which is the closest thing to me, you know? Mm -hmm. So that stuff kind of, you know, come on. <laughs> it needs to be fixed. So, I don't know. Yeah, lots of, lots of really cool, interesting stuff. They did say that... You know, our Apple TVs. One of the main reasons I have I, I have Apple TV is for photos and yeah. you know, obviously for entertainment and all that stuff. But they kind of slipped it in there that, like, what was it about a year, two years ago? They they started that conversation about the Apple TV would be the hub for your home kit and it would be controlling all your devices and all that. They said it again today and demoed oh, yeah. it. They yeah. demoed it and showed that, hey, look in Control Center on the phone. You can flip up and have all your control all your disparate devices and set up scenes like they've been talking about before, where I could say, you know, it's good night time and all the lights shut off and alarms come on and all that mm. stuff. So, 
yeah, I'm I'm looking forward to that, but you know, none of this stuff is shipping yet. Well, and I hope they fix the remote. The oh for for oh they added they added uh what is it the yeah, Apple TV remote they updated the remote app to be on par with the with the physical app or physical because remote. the little the little touch is so sensitive. Oh, it is. Mm. It is. It's just mm. you know, and we'll have it you know because what is it what is it a uh, CEC now it's called so if you hit it it automatically switches your HDMI input. Yeah, I have that too. Yeah. Yeah. So you know it's on a nightstand or something you you bump it up and your your TV switches and. Yeah, no, it's just uh, it's a little too sensitive, but I wish it. Mm -hmm. I wish it was capacitive touch, like the phone, where it actually right. needed like skin in order to activate it. Where yeah. it is now, it's like anything can. You can drop a you know yeah. a pillow on it, and it'll. Yeah, we've been we've been big Apple TV fans. I used to have the the original one with the hard drive. I still have it, and mm -hmm. we used to run photos on it in the studio because yeah. we were burning out DVD mm -hmm. players. Plus, you had an HD monitor, and you were only getting you know the short resolution. So we're like, let's get an Apple TV. We were loading photos onto it manually. You had to hook it up to iTunes and then put photos on it, but then we had a really nice high-res slideshow that played on the 52-inch monitor. Mm -hmm. Well, then when the new little ones came out, um, we just set up our own unique iCloud account, and I would drop prints, edited prints, into that folder, and it would automatically sync, and that would be the slideshow on the monitor in the studio when people came through. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it worked mm -hmm. out great. Yeah, now there's no hard drive. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah did, no hard drive. Uh, were either of you guys disappointed when the the latest Apple TV wasn't 4K or not? Not yet. Worry? No. no. Nah. I don't have a 4K television, a 4K. so it didn't it didn't really. You know, I was mm -hmm. I was sad that it wasn't future proof, so that ultimately when I get a 4K television. I would, you know, I'd be able to use it, but my my brain was thinking, well, hey, I don't have I don't have any 4K televisions in the house right now, mm -hmm. and by the time it's time for me to buy a 4K television, which might be a couple of years, I'm sure that version of the Apple TV will probably have 4K. Mm -hmm. you, you know, that's where I was. I bought a 4K TV um, two summers ago, and I was really hoping for 4K. Um, but I mean, the, I guess what's happening is that. The difference between 1080p, full proper 1080p, and 4K is not that great, you know. So the 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 videos still look really really nice on a 4K TV. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it's it's not that big a deal. It doesn't worry me too much. But I I would have liked to have been able to have shown my photographs at 4K, at native 4K, because yeah. what what I do right now is I can put them onto a USB stick and put them in the back of the TV. And play them directly there, and they, they look incredible. You know, cool. images, because it's like, what does it work out at? Like eight mega eight megapixels, or or eleven or twelve megapixels, something like that. It, it's, it's huge. Eight. Yeah. Yeah, uh, and so you're actually looking at these. I mean, it's a 55 inch TV, and wow. photos at 4K, they look amazing. So I was hoping for that, um, more than video. I think I was really hoping to be able to just show photographs. Using the apps that are in the Apple TV at 4K, so yeah. that was a little bit disappointing for me. But. Yeah, yeah, no, I hear you, and I my armchair quarterbacking for for Apple would say that they're probably thinking, yeah, the Martin Baileys and the people that are in that use case are probably mm -hmm. relatively small right now, a small but growing contingent, but still. Mm. You know, we'll we'll do it this way and keep it cheap or whatever for now, and then we'll add. You know, you yeah. got to leave something to add for the the one more thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah, and in, and in terms of video, there's not a ton of content out there right now, um, but cameras getting cheaper. You know, a lot more people are shooting with you know Reds and Alexa and you know all these great cameras, and I think there's mm. going to be more and more of that. Um, in the next few years, probably everybody will transition over. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's it's interesting that this that the 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 move from when we went from what was it 640 by 480 <laughs> to to HD that was kind of a jump, that right? Was I mean, that was a huge leap from hey, I can see a photo and they didn't have to put on makeup and they still look fantastic <laughs> to yeah. HD or even 720, which was lower resolution, but it was still like wow, that is mm. that's that's clear. And then 1080 which was fantastic, and now we're talking 4K. So well, and now actually they're talking 8K now, right? There's some 8K right, right. televisions up. I'm old enough to remember when we had four streams of 720 by 486 video going at once that we could edit. Oh wow! <laughs> video toaster days. <laughs> that was a video toaster, right? Remember that? Video toaster was unlimited. Oh. Yeah. 
Yeah, that, that newer video toaster unlimited, but the hundred thousand dollar avid could do four streams at once. Mm-hmm. And now you can do four streams on your iPhone, can't you? I know, isn't that crazy? <laughs> at four K. Four K. It's crazy. So guys, I wanted to pivot this conversation. Of, uh, so, you know, continuing on this, one of the things that Apple announced, was, and they put a little bit of emphasis on this, again, as they've been doing in almost every keynote, was the idea of they are not pushing off their machine intelligence or artificial intelligence scanning of your photos and data and all that stuff into the cloud. Instead, they're doing it all locally behind their you know, as we all know, and the world knows, and the FBI in particular <laughs> knows that their security is pretty, you know, for the most part, bulletproof in a lot of ways. So they're pushing all of their intelligence behind that bulletproof wall versus companies like Google, et cetera, that are, are applying machine intelligence in the cloud. Guys, I want to get your opinion on that. Dan, is that, is that the right way to go? I mean, do you feel, you feel good about that? You know, I don't know if I'm good about it, but... Um, <laughs> You know, I, you know, it's kind of like like anywhere. You know, if somebody wants in, they're going to get in, um, one way or another. I, I think it's really the way to go. I've been working that way for probably the last two years um, because I work remote a lot and putting things up. And I've tried many, you know, between iCloud and Dropbox. But to the point where, let's say, I'm doing photo editing or doing 3D animation, those files lately are not even living locally. I'll copy them over. I'll put them up there. And then whatever computer I'm on, I can actually pull those right from a cloud server. Yeah. Um, but as somebody once said on Facebook, there is no cloud. It's just somebody else's hard drive. <laughs> yeah, it is. Yeah. You know, so, yeah, but I think it's a good way to go. Um, the more they do it, the more everybody pushes that way, uh, the more they're going to work for tighter security and, you know, keep it a little bit uh, a little bit better resource for everybody and, and faster, and it's just... Yeah, the more they just just like the 4K TVs, the more we use them, the more we're going to start seeing uh, content for it. Yeah, and I was I was thinking as I was watching the keynote about that privacy thing. You know, they 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 did emphasize that hey, we we care about your privacy and you know all this this all that rhetoric. But I was I was thinking, what do you give up? Like I for me, just just to put a fine point on it, I I like the fact that Apple is throwing up that giant wall that hopefully is impenetrable and all my data kind of lives behind it. Um, I'm a fan of that, but I also see the Google side of it where the data living in the cloud, you can do a lot more with it, right? Mm-hmm. And you can you can examine it and do inferences based on what other people are doing and overlay traffic data and, you know, it just it becomes a kind of a communal effort versus in terms of data patterns versus things being their own silos and you can only interact with and and make inferences based on the data that's on your phone. Martin, does that like which side do you fall on? Do you want you want your data in the cloud so they can do more crunching on it or do you pref- are you feel you feel better about it being behind your the wall? You know, I I feel better about it being behind the wall on my computer, but not for privacy reasons. Um, I, it's for me, I just like to have things crunching away here rather than having to upload them. And you know, it's just a bandwidth thing. I, I've got I've got a really fast connection here, but I I also I've got a cap. If I go if I upload more than thirty gigabytes of data in any twenty four hours, I get a, a, a I get a, a physical mail, a snail mail. Um, that tells me that if I don't stop, I've got they're going to cap they're going to choke my account. Okay. So I, it's fast, but I've got limitations. So the less I can get, I get going up through up the pipe to the to the cloud, the better. Um, but as far as um, you know, my own personal data. I mean, I don't store anything. You know, it's not like I'm taking I don't know like na- photos of people naked or <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not doing anything and putting it in my account or, you know, music, photos, I'm not doing anything that I wouldn't really be too concerned, that I'd be really too concerned about anyone seeing. Um, yeah. Even documents, I I have, the only place that I I need to keep safe is I use a um, a password synchronization app called 1Password yeah, and all of the too. data in there is in, it's, in, it's encrypted. So, you know, as long as as long as I keep people away from my passwords for everything, I don't really care what people see. I don't have anything that's that private. Yeah, let me let me stave off some of the mail now from the privacy advocates in the TWIP army. They're going to be saying, "Well, Martin, you know, the argument of I don't have anything to hide, therefore, you know, I'm okay with 
people infringing on my privacy because you know I'm I'm inherently a good person. They'll we talked about this on the previous show. The argument that comes up is that may be true, but who's to say what you're keeping private is is not illegal or you know maybe someone thinks that the fact that you co you collect monarch butterflies flags you as a terrorist because all terrorists collect monarch butterflies right so <laughs> you could get it looped into or or reined into a group without your you know without knowing and then that will Im impact you and your family going forward so i mean mm -hmm. privacy you know i think the brute force approach uh, of it is saying yeah privacy yeah, I don't do anything wrong. None of us do anything wrong that you know that we'd want, we wouldn't, that we think we need to hide from the government for. But that's not the point. We we've seen the government do things, or many other governments, including the United States government and the Japanese government and the Chicago government, do things, <laughs> <laughs> do things, do things that uh, you know aren't necessarily in the citizens' best interest. So. You yeah, know. you know, and it's, it's about ownership, too. It's, you know, the big discussion a few years ago when Adobe went to the cloud uh, for all their apps. Mm -hmm. And we, I think we even talked about it on one show. I love it. I, I think it's great because that's, that's the bread and butter, and now I've got every application fully updated all the time. Mm -hmm. Because other people, they hated it. They want to own the app. They want the disk. They want to be able to install it and whenever they want. And, but, and I was that last person. I hated it in the beginning, but then when I sat down for a second and actually thought through the math and, mm -hmm. and the convenience that, that Adobe was giving, you know, granted, they're making money hand over fist doing this, but the convenience of not having disks and installing it, my Internet's always on. It's, you know, for the most part, Comcast. It is, it's, for the most part, reliable. So, you know, aside from those early activation hiccups they da they had when they rolled out Creative Cloud, mm -hmm. I've, I've been happy with it. The only the only negative that I see about it is I feel like I'm paying for a lot of stuff that I'm not using, because you know I signed up right now and I could probably scale back, but I've signed up for the regular Creative Cloud, not just the photographer edition, and I can count on on less than one finger how many times I've needed to launch After Effects or InDesign or you know any of those apps that I get along with the cloud. The only thing that I typically use is Premiere, or the only apps I use are Premiere and Photoshop and Lightroom, you know, for the most part. You know, I, I used to always buy the Master Suite, and that was yeah. a ridiculously $1, expensive upgrade. package. Exactly. Um, for me, I, I actually, I use about half of what's in the suite. I'm looking down my list now, I've got, in addition to Photoshop and Lightroom, I've got Illustrator, InDesign, Acrobat DC, cool. Premiere Pro, After Effects, Audition, Bridge, and the Media Encoder. Yeah. Um, and that's that's pretty much what I use, and I feel that for me, I'm getting my money's worth out of that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I I love it too, and and I I probably will get a lot of heat for this, but I I actually think that the majority of the people that were really vocal about the the new model were the people that weren't paying full, <laughs> full price for what they were yeah. getting anyway. I mean, it's like people that were stealing it. Like, what do you mean? I I can't like get a serial number off BitTorrent anymore. What's going right. on? <laughs> I mean, you know, I I think that. It's important to understand, and this is an old argument, so I'm not going to go on about this, but I think it's important to understand that software companies can only continue to do what they do if they've got revenue to do it with. Mm -hmm. And and I think that it's you know it's a natural thing. And it, it felt I, I felt a little bit of resistance initially to the idea, but you know, it's how things are now. So we just we just adjust and, and carry on. Yeah, and capture one now, subscription based, and how many others, you know, and so it kind of all goes together with the cloud service and everything we're talking about, you know, and are people, you know, technically people really weren't owning their software anyway. If you read the software right. license, right. you didn't yeah. really own it anyway. But, you were renting it, yeah. You know, but yeah. it's, it's, I think it's that ownership that somebody else mm -hmm. has your file, somebody else has your software that you're paying for. But It's interesting, it's interesting, this, the whole subscription model, and I'm going to dovetail this back into, uh, into WWDC in a second. But the whole subscription model, um, and I'm on the fence about it. In some cases, in some areas, I'm like, really? There's a subscription tied to this? Come on. You know, can I just buy it? And if I don't want it next year, if I want it next year, I'll buy it again. Why do I have to, like, commit and have it auto-renew? Um, but there was this, uh, there's this, I just installed a new digital doorbell on my house. It's from a company called Ring. Have you guys heard of Ring? Mm -hmm. No. So I just installed a ring on the house, and I got it. I put it in. Thing works great. I mean, it's ridiculous. So now wherever I am, somebody rings my doorbell. I can see them and talk to them, and they think I'm home or whatever. So not now, because you just told everybody. 
<laughs> not now. Yeah, well, you know, exactly. Uh, but the the thing is, it came with a subscription. So if you, it will record yeah. the video so that you can look back on it and, you know, somebody stole a package from your front porch, you could see who it was and, you know, all this stuff. Um, and it's cheap. I, I forget what the yearly cost is, but it's it's like a couple dollars a month or something, like less than a couple of cu- cup of coffee. But I looked at it initially, and I'm like, really? Now my doorbell has a subscription. <laughs> you know? We put in a uh, Nest camera. It has the same thing. I know, I know. <laughs> I, and I didn't turn that on either. So, uh, But for the doorbell, I think I'm going to turn it on because... Like that's different, you know, because it, it, first of all, it doesn't cost that much. It's like a cost cost of a cup of coffee at Starbucks or something. I could turn that on and have that added convenience of being a, <clears throat> excuse me being able to see what's happening in the front of my house. If I don't turn it on, it doesn't reduce the functionality. That money goes to pay for their server and all that stuff. But if I don't turn it on, I can still see people. Yeah, just don't get the recording of what happened because it has a motion sensor in there too. So mm-hmm. somebody comes up and knocks on my door and runs away, I can look at the video and see see who it was. Without the subscription, I can't see who it was. So <laughs> I think I'm gonna i I'm gonna get it. Uh but it's uh you know, the whole process so far has been has been pretty cool. Um but dovetailing back into this whole WWDC thing, uh Dan Ablin you, you, did you watch the keynote all the way through? Uh, I kind of went, yeah, chopped through it, yeah. Yeah, you jumped through it, yeah, yeah, like me too. So anything in there that, that jumped out at you that you thought was exciting? I'll tell you the one thing that jumped out at me was the attention that they paid to messaging and making yeah, Apple messages thinking. more like WhatsApp. Like, what, what do you think? Yeah. yeah, I think so too. Um, and I think they're paying attention closely to, to Samsung and Android and, you know, and how, how that... Texting has been working. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I, I think the texting alone, its it reminds me of, you know, one of the 3D apps I use is, is Moto from Luxology. And one of their models, what they would do, instead of doing big wow updates all the time, they would kind of go back and they would do a ton of these cool little, just neat little changes and fixes, you know, really tidying things up, which made the program even stronger. And that's what I feel Apple is doing with this. You know, nothing really groundbreaking, but just really cool functionality that, you know, there are little things that make things a little bit easier to use, a little fun, more fun to use. So, yeah. um, and then that next one, they'll probably go back to, you know, a big wow thing. Yeah, I, it would suck to be Apple, man, and you know, as a as a business. <laughs> yeah, sure I mean, would. Aside pounds, from having more money than than you know most governments, but like just <laughs> just, no, the, just the idea that the press and the rumor mill and Wall Street and the guy next door and his grandmother yeah. they all make their inferences based on what you should release, and if you don't release that thing, you're a failure. <laughs> you know? Well, you know, regardless of your roadmap, if you don't no matter what, though, they're still buying, yeah. and we'll see what you know Martin thinks too. But you know, I take the train a lot into the city, and I sit up. Ours have two layers, and so I sit up top in the single seats, and I look, and I always pay attention. And while there's a lot of those little PC laptops that companies license out, that the ID department license out, I might see out of 60 seats, two Androids, two or three Androids. Mm. Everybody's on an iPhone or an iPad. Yeah. You know, and it's just I. I Pay attention. I look around. No matter what, they they still buy them. And so all these little features, these cool little things, keep them keep them coming back. So yeah, it's funny. So that I I notice that too. Here, it, as I as I move around the country, I see that same sort of I do that same sort of informal survey, yeah. and I look around like, oh, there's Android, and you know, and for the most part, it, it's generally iPhone. But that switches when you get out of the country. So yeah, when you leave the United States, Martin, maybe you could chime in on this. When you leave the United States, maybe maybe Japan is saturated too, but a you know Vietnam, Paris, London, there's a lot of iPhones, but you see many more other devices other than just iPhone. Here it seems to be saturated. I don't know, Martin, what do you think? Yeah, you know, in Japan, there there's a lot of iPhones, um, but. There's a lot of other devices as well. The, ga- the galaxies, the, there's a whole bunch of Android devices that have got pretty good traction here. Um, some people, uh, I think, just make a conscious decision that they're not going to use Apple products. Um, and I, you know, honestly, I, I think that if it's, it's probably like the old cut your nose off to spite your face sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, because it, I, I personally think that my life is richer for having Apple products in it. 
you know, I mean, that probably would make me sound like a total geek, but I, um, I just love the way everything ties in and it all just works together and it feels good. I, I've never sat on the sofa with a Windows laptop on my lap, on my lap and, and caressed it. <laughs> but 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 occasionally you get a little personal my, here, Martin. Uh, you know. <laughs> but occasionally I look down at that little silver MacBook Pro on my lap, and I'll just go, "Oh, you beautiful little thing!" And yeah. it's like, you know, I, mean, I think I think people get attached to Apple devices in a different way. Yeah. Um, and that's part of the beauty of Apple. You know, they they've just done things that that no other company's really ever been able to do. Totally, I agree. I agree. Yeah, one of the things. Speaking of hardware, one of the things that I was hoping that I'd see that I saw on one of the rumor sites was, and maybe this will still show up, but they one of the rumor sites had a MacBook Pro with an OLED strip at the top that was replacing the function keys up there. So you'd essentially have a little strip display that could change based on the app that you're using. I thought that was cool. So yeah, you know yeah. that I want that on my next computer, and I want Touch ID on my next my next portable computer. Well, you know, and yeah. just to add to that real quick, because you know, I agree. Some people, you know, I hate Apple. I hate Android. You know, mm -hmm. I never really did either. I was PC for a lot of years. Still mm -hmm. have one or two. Um, but when we went to the iPhone, it worked the best. But last year, I Fred, if you remember, might remember, I bought that uh, S6 Edge. Yeah. Yeah, and it was beautiful, and I had a little mm. window to use it, but you know what? The integration, I was doing a lot more work to have it integrated with my MacBook Pro, okay. my iPad, and even like the other day, you know, with the 6S, I've got the, the fat battery pack on it and <laughs> uh, unlimited data now, but it was upstairs. I'm downstairs on my, on my laptop, phone, my phone or my cell phone rang, answered it on the laptop. Yeah. yeah. You know, and that kind of integration in the house and everything else, and... You know, we had people over. We needed to show them something. Oh, pop up the phone, throw it to the Apple TV. Mm. You know, that's that's the whole key with mm. using all the Apple products. It's sticky. It's a sticky ecosystem. And, yeah, it, 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 switching costs, I, I think there's the switching costs that are that are pretty high if you like right now if you're you're so embedded into the Apple world and you decide, oh, you know what, I'm going to go try Android, you will definitely feel the burn yeah. trying to go in the other direction. Um, but, you know, same for Android. You know, the longer we stick with iOS and the more apps we buy and the more integrated we come and we become sticky with the phone and got the watch and the tablets and everything mm -hmm. syncing and it just works, we, you get to this point where you're like, okay, or me personally, I get to this point where I'm like, this stuff is a, it's a tool that lets me do my ultimate, get to the ultimate destination, which is to get work done. You know, in the case of this stuff, it lets me publish TWIP and run the network and all that stuff. The tools that let me do that should be ancillary and arguing about the tools that people choose, whether it be, hey, you're Android versus I refuse to use an iPhone because, you know, Apple is too dominant or Android sucks because blah, 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 you know, or, you know, I drive a, this kind of car because that kind of car sucks. Who cares? You know, it's, it's about, if you're arguing about cars, you should be, it should be about the destination that you're getting to, you know, not about how you're getting to it. You don't hear carpenters arguing about, hey, I have a, I have a hammer that has, you know, black hole material in it versus yours, which is only dwarf star. You know, <laughs> come on, dude. It's just, it's, it's about the house that you're building, not about what's in the hammer that built that house. I don't know. Yeah, that's the curmudgeonly old Frederick talking. <laughs> Get over yourselves, people. It's just stuff. <laughs> so, all right, guys. We're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we're going to talk about a Kickstarter project that's looking to bring the world's first universal camera to market. All right, guys. We are back. This next story is about Kickstarter. And we try not to cover too many Kickstarters on TWIP because a lot of them never end up making their way to market, but occasionally we cover one, like we covered the whole Everyday Messenger thing, and I have one in today's show as my pick of the week. Uh, but this one is, it's a project that they're aiming to create the world's first universal camera because we thought it might make some interesting discussion. Did you guys take a look at this? Martin, did you, did you take a look at this? What, what do you think? First of all, set it up for us. What is Mercury? What is this universal camera? Yeah, so, yes, I did take a look, only this morning, um, but um, it's basically a, a camera that, it, it's, from what I understand so far, it, it will enable you to use pretty much any lens 
and any back, um, including you know 35 millimeter film or or digital, but also some of the larger formats, and it. It looks as though you're going to have manual, um, only manual control over the camera, which is fine. I think if you're at this level of um, nostalgia anyway, manual is fine for me. And I, I think there's a lot of people out there that probably would be the same. But um, looking at the prices that they're touting on, on the Kickstarter page, it doesn't look overly expensive. And to me, I mean, I would buy one of these just, you know, just for the nostalgia reason, although it's new. Um, I've got old behind me over there I've got some old um, Canon cameras old film cameras and um, that have got nice little lenses on them and I do enjoy shooting film as well so I could see me getting one of these and a 120 film back and um, just just let him rip with it it looks like an amazing amazing little um, piece of kit it looks it looks interesting and I have my own thoughts before I before I cloud it though Dan Dan Ablin what do you, what do you think yeah, I pretty much agree with Martin. You know, I don't know. It's just going to take off. It's going to eat the mirrorless market. I don't think so. But um, I too have my old Canon lenses, a Vivitar lens. Uh, I got an old Mamiya lens. Um, and for something not expensive that could possibly give me a little bit different look in shooting and let me use some of those old lenses, which you know, there there's something about them. Um, years ago when I used to shoot with them that I just don't see today. It would be neat. Um, would it be the main go-to camera? I don't know. Um, yeah. But yeah, it's I, it's worth a shot. <laughs> yes, literally, literally, literally and figuratively. <laughs> yeah, my what I what I think I think I, I like it, and I like the idea of being able to kind of do whatever you want, right? Put whatever lens, whatever back, and 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 just rock it like that. But then, in in if depending on the you know the price, what is it? Yeah, depending on the price and what it ultimately nets out at, I would probably get one. But then the other side of me is like, that looks like a whole lot of work to, <laughs> to do your photos when you could just, you know, just go grab one. It, like Martin, just go. It, it seems like in a lot of ways it's photography, it, which is there's nothing wrong with this, but it's photography for the sake of, of the mechanics of doing photography versus photography for the ultimate goal of mm -hmm. storytelling and creating the image. And there's a right. lot of people out there like that. There's the guys who like to change their own oil and do their own breaks. And mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah, like I said, nothing wrong with it. Yeah, it's same kind of idea. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. It's it's interesting. It's pretty. I would put one and and put it on display in my living room. It looks <laughs> 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 like hot. Frederick, have you shot with that thing? No, no. I'm sure, sure that's that. what they're going for. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, you know, I, I agree. I think that it is really, it's about the, the manual process. It's about film. I mean, you, the, people will argue that film is, gives you a better quality image than digital. And I think that the majority of the time, unless you're talking medium format and, and really, you know, some of the very expensive high resolution cameras, you're, you're really not seeing that. But it's... It's fun, you know. I mean, I've got a, a twin lens reflex camera in my lens cabinet behind me, and I uh, I I enjoy sticking a roll of 120 in there and just just taking that into town. Um, if I if I'm going to go off and do some of my landscape or my or my wildlife work or pretty much anything else, I'll use my 5DS. But I, you know, it's it's good. It's it's nice nostalgia, and um, I think there's certainly. A place in the. I mean, this this almost reminds me of some of the conversations that uh, Ron Brinkman had on Twitter years ago. He's always talking about the this kind of thing, and and I, uh, I I think that it's it's a great idea. I'll probably back it. I've only literally only just seen this this morning. I'll probably back it as well. Yeah, Dan Dan, you you have owned a physical studio in in the Chicago land yeah. area. Can you see a scenario where you would get one of these guys and build kind of like the boutique hipster studio and you shoot with this and it's, you know, part of it's theatrics and the other part is actually image making and customer service? No, you know, I, I've gotten past the point of the the bragging rights of cameras. I think the last time I did that was my daughter was little at uh, a dance recital and, you know, everybody's there with their little Costco SLRs and, you know, I came in with my D3 and the... 200 lines, like, excuse me, you know, and had to do that. Yeah. Um, now I carry a little Samsung around day to day, so 
for something like this in a studio, if I was getting the image quality, we were doing like you know one of those nice long afternoon shoots where you're just kind of playing and experimenting and changing the light, and I could get a little bit different look with this, I absolutely would put one in. You would? Nice, nice, yeah. I don't know the theatrics. The theatrics of uh, digital photography versus the the actual art of taking photos. I like it. I mean, I would. I think Martin, I'm right behind you. I think I'll back them. They're at um, where are they at? Uh, Twenty three thousand two hundred six dollars dollars of their fifty thousand. So they're just shy of fifty percent there. So mm-hmm. with our help, Twippers, we can push them all the way there so that we can get one of these things. Well, I'll tell you what. What I would try not to derail this too much because I haven't heard much about this since last year is the light camera with oh yeah I remember that the one with all the with all, all the little the lenses light. in there yeah yeah. Uh-huh. yeah I don't know if it's out yet but light.co it's still there I wonder I wonder interesting oh speaking of last year last year uh, what was it last year that lynda.com got acquired by LinkedIn remember yeah. that and then today's news you guys heard right LinkedIn has agreed to be acquired by Microsoft $26 billion. 26 largest tech acquisition in history. So one fish eats another fish, eats another fish. <laughs> you know, and, and as somebody who has three little courses on Linda, I was really hoping for, like, maybe a, a gift check in the mail and just <laughs> didn't happen. <laughs> Good luck. Keep, share the love with everybody a little bit. I think you should hold your breath. Just hold your breath and wait. Yeah. <laughs> All right, guys, uh, that's it for the Mercury Camera. Yeah, we'll put a link to the Kickstarter page in show notes. Go ahead and support them if you guys feel so inclined. I think I'm going to I'm gonna throw a couple dollars behind them and uh, help, them, help them fund this effort. All right, guys, after the break, we're going to answer one of our listener questions. All right, we are back again. Periodically on This Week in Photo, we answer a question that has come in from one of the TWIP army. This this week we have a question from JC. And JC says, as an Instagram user and follower, I found the following website and Instagram and Instagram user artofvisuals.com. The site features images of shooters who are willing to upload their images to their site. Their exposure, the exposure an image gets is quite unique, or quite good, rather, but you need to agree to their terms of service, which is the crux of this question. So he asks, he, JC asks, the website is... This is a quote from, the, uh, from their terms of service. The website is intended to be a site where users can upload pictures, which pictures can then be copied, reproduced, modified, and used for any and all purposes by other users for no compensation payable to the user that uploaded the picture and without any permission being required. So he goes on, JC goes on to say, I think most people don't really understand that they are giving away their usage rights to them, even for commercial purposes. Maybe I don't get it, but maybe you could look into it and see for yourself if is this right or wrong. Martin, you uh, you submit images to stock photography, so you're maybe both of you guys do, but Martin, I know for sure. Do you, that little blurb from their terms of service does that seem shifty, or is that uh, is that oh, normal yeah. par for the course? No, absolutely shifty. Um, I. I wouldn't go near this website. Um, I, I personally, you know, I, I, it's, it says that uh, giving up your usage rights, I think you said, um, yeah. so you're not giving up your usage rights. You, you maintain your own copyright and everything, but giving someone a free run with your images and looking at the website, I mean, the first thing I see on the top page is the price for various things that you can buy from them. Um, yeah. You know, if they're making money, they should be paying people that are helping them to make their money. So... I'm, yeah, I wouldn't go anywhere near this. Yeah, it, the, my my first reaction when I read it is, you know, it kind of smelled fishy. And usually, mm. you know, if it smells fishy, then it was probably fishy. <laughs> I don't know. Dan Ablin, what do you think of this? Yeah, absolutely. I, you know, there's so many places to share your work and have it stolen legitimately. Why would you give permission to do it? <laughs> yeah. you, know, you know what I mean? Um, <laughs> you have plenty of opportunity to be ripped off. Why do it willingly? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Um, no, if they, but I agree. I totally agree. If they're making money on it, you know, they should be paying for it. But, you know, there's a lot of shifty people out there. There was one guy, and I'm not going to say it because he's litigious, um, that steals people's training videos. He rent, he buys them and legally, under a loophole from 1928, can rent them out one at a time. <laughs> under the, something me. called the first sale doctrine. Um, 
so you know people take advantage and they'll take it this site will take advantage of people not reading the small print um, you know if you're new and you feel this is something you want to do and you're okay with it then by all means do it but I think for professionals that are really serious about their imagery uh, and want to protect it you know there's enough there's enough uh, images being stolen online as it is you know you can do a Google image search and one of my images that I had published in a couple of magazines uh, I decided to do an image search on it and it's on the cover of a Japanese photography book no a Chinese photography book really uh, and nothing I can do about it you know they took it right off the web and took my watermark off and put it right on the cover of their book so mm -hmm. um, yeah yeah I, so you just you got to be careful yeah. You know, read the fine I'm print. looking at this. I'm looking at this like this shot I have on the screen right now is a waterfall shot that they're they're selling for twenty bucks. In yeah, for small. any and all purposes, it says in there, which means they can sell it for whatever they want. Whatever yeah. they want. Yeah, and this is not. It's an okay shot, but I, I feel like I could probably get it legitimately off like, you know, iStock or Shutterfly, Shutterstock or something like that. Or, mm -hmm. Martin, what's the site that you have your stock imagery on? I'm I'm with Offset. They're a, a Shutterstock sister company. They're they're like the the high end um, stock for for the Shutterstock family. Yeah. Mm, okay. They're great. Um, you know, a couple of weeks ago when I was on Twitter last month, I I mentioned that you know I, I was looking for people to introduce to Offset, and I had a lot of people contacted me, and a few of them are actually now being put through, and they're they're on their way to to being a contributor as well. So awesome. it's uh, it's great. Yeah. It's the power of I the Twitter. I didn't know about them either. Yeah. Oh, you didn't know about them? Did you? No. No. Yeah. There you go. There you go. You heard it here first on This Week in Photo. And I'll tell you this. I had to buy some images for a place I worked, and we had to buy a Studio 54 image. And it was, uh, I don't know, $15,000. This place went, and I'm not going to say the name, but it sounds like Petty. And um, they wanted $500 just to ask the photographer if we can use the image for the ad we were putting it in. Non-refundable. Wow. See, Martin, I that, you I'm gonna see if them. I can. I'm gonna see if I can. If I can register the domain Petty Images, that'd be <laughs> pretty cool. Already done. It's all right. <laughs> oh man, that's cool. All right, so JC, I hope that answered your question. My, I guess the 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 takeaway from this is if something seems too good to be true, it probably is. Yeah. So, yeah, just caveat you know, in tour. You know, we probably should say, though, good catch, JC. You know, it's, yeah. uh, it's good that you're looking out for that stuff. For sure. For yeah. now. That's right, and thanks for bringing it to the attention of the Twit Army so other people won't fall into this pit of quicksand or similar pits of quicksand. <laughs> All right. Uh, if you guys have a question you'd like us to hit on the show, just click on that Contact Us link at the top of the page and select TWIP, the main show, to submit your question. If you have a question for any of our other shows on the network, you can similarly select that show and type your question, and it will go directly to those show hosts. All right, guys, we're going to real quick jump into the Picks of the Week segment. Remember, you can pick anything to recommend to the TWIP Army as long as it is somehow related to photography. Dan Ablin, which okay. Pick of the week? Uh, I know you've been into drones lately, and I saw this just last week, the DJI Phantom Focus. Is that what they're calling it? What? What is that? I have DJI. no idea what that is. DJI Focus. Um, <laughs> you got to watch the video, uh, so look at the link. Um, and essentially, let me read this here. Uh, it's a control wheel. It can be calibrated at different lenses to keep the motor from turning past the minimum maximum focus. But it's, you know, it's for drone, for aerial photography. So essentially, the way I'm reading this in the video, it's, it's rack focusing for drone photography. And rack it's, focusing? But it's, it's a wide-angle lens. It's pretty damn cool. But to, to watch the video. Okay. All right. Uh, yeah, I mean, they're, they're doing even like low panning shots and things and changing the focus and... Um, it's just what? It's okay. Oh, oh, it's for those real drones, though. You know, like the Inspire <laughs> series of drones. <laughs> no, it's for DJI. Well, no, DJI makes the Inspire and oh, the Phantom, they? the Phantom Three, which is the yeah, one. I have the Phantom Three, but now the Four is out. So. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Okay, I'll have to watch this. <laughs> Very cool. Scary, but yeah, I'm seeing the people that are using this device. And yeah. Serious. Yeah, yeah. These are these are people that have their coffee brought to them. <laughs> <laughs> that would not be me. Yeah, that would not be me. So yeah, very cool. Good, good pick of the week. Yeah. All right, Martin, what's your pick? 
You know, I um, I have one behind me in the in the distance for those that are looking on the video um, right over there. I've also got another one next to me here. Um, I just bought a couple of uh, I'm not sure how you pronounce it if, it, if it's LED Go or LED Go, um, but I I bought a couple of these uh, the Value Series LED Panel 600, and they're um, they're pretty neat. They're uh, they're not you know some LED panels they have um, like half 5,400 and half 3,200 the, the really the orange LEDs and if you put them you can switch between them and you know you can go from really warm light to daylight um, white balance um, but the the problem with that is that they generally if you go to one extreme you only get half the LEDs lit up so you lose the 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 power it's not as bright. Um, but these things, you know, I decided I knew that I was only going to use them in daylight. So these are they don't they're just full power, but they're very bright. I mean, I I, I know that it's a, it's an audio show, but if I turn this on, um, and then I'll probably be able to blind. I mean, oh, <laughs> if, yeah. you, if you yeah. look at the video there, they're pretty bright for what they are, um, and they're like three hundred and something bucks. Um, very very bright. I think they're I've got the the B and H page here. They're 5,220 looks at one meter. Um, so the reason I bought these was partly because I want, I'm going to be doing some video and I wanted some constant light so that just to get a, a decent shutter speed and everything for video in my studio. But I also did some still photography with them yesterday um, for, for this week's podcast. I needed some photos of a book that I did and I just set these up either side and the light was pretty was quite pleasing you know they've got these um, like diffuser panels on the front so it's it can they can be used um, as an alternative to strobes whether you know I think that the power is not there really for I mean I, I've got uh, pro photo strobes big beautiful soft boxes so if I really need to do any studio work I'm still gonna get those out but for for a quick shoot you know if they're hanging around the studio it's they're, they're pretty good so I thought I'd make that my pick of the week. I like those. I like those, and they were, if I am not mistaken, three hundred and forty bucks. Yeah. So I mean, the, the same company actually does. They even says on here the Value series. These are the cheapo version of a more expensive one that's about one hundred and fifty bucks more. But you know, for what I needed them for, I figured I'd um, act for on a very rare occasion do the sensible thing and go for the less expensive one. <laughs> normally, I, normally I just buy the most expensive I can find, but. Yeah. It was. It wasn't that kind of project. Very cool. Awesome. All right. Very good pick of the week. Look at that. Thank you. All right. My pick. I have a pick this week. I don't always have a pick, but this week I have a pick, and it is. Let me find the window. Here it is. Right here. It's a Kickstarter project, like I alluded to earlier, but it's a Platypod Pro, and I was first introduced to these, I think, by Derek Story. I believe he had. One and it's. I have one right here. Let me grab it. Okay. All right. So it's a deceptively looking, and I'll switch the camera to me in a second. But it's a deceptively looking simple plate with a with a threaded mount on it, on which you can mount your camera or a tripod head or something. But what it does is it gives essentially gives your devices a foot instead of being a tripod or being a you know, a monster pod or whatever, this thing gives you a flat foot with spikes in it that you can then put on uneven surfaces. So it's uh, it's really, really cool. And mine, I'll show you how I have mine set up. Like, I'm showing the pictures here for you folks in, that are listening to the audio. But you can pretty much put it anywhere. You know, if you think of, like, okay, I want to I wanna set my DSLR or my mirrorless camera or whatever on a table and you don't want to carry a giant tripod with you, this thing will slip right in the back pocket on your tripod bag, you know, in your camera bag, and off you go. It's actually, it's, it's deceptively simple and convenient how it works. And once you get one, it's kind of hard to, like, think about not having one. So here's, here's the way I use mine right here. So I have it on an ice light. So if you see this, this is a, the ice light from Westcott, and on the bottom... I have the Platypod Pro, Pro foot on there. So now I can set this on the desk right next to me and power this thing on like this if it's not dead. Yeah, there you go. I can power it on and then just slide it off to the side just like that. So it's like a table lamp. I can travel with this. I can light myself doing podcasts in the hotel rooms or whatever. And all I have is just this, 
you know, there's no elaborate system. It's just a little foot that I can sit for a little accent lighting wherever I am. Right. So, nice. Yeah, it's actually really, really cool. I'm happy with this. They came out with a big one just recently, the, pa- the Platypod Pro, which is the one that they're, they were seeking kick- Kickstarter funding for. Um, but they have a smaller one, which I have as well, which works really well for mirrorless cameras and there's whatever you want to put on top of it. It's actually actually really cool. So they are, right now, they were, actually just a couple days ago, this was like at, they, they hadn't made their goal yet. And their goal is $30,000. They're already at sixty, almost $61,000 for this thing. And they still have another half a month to go. So, oh, nice. <laughs> so clearly they're making some money and they, they're on to something nice. pretty cool. Like I said, Derek's story of the digital story turned me on to this thing, and I got one, and yeah, I'm, I'm excited. So, yeah, definitely check them out, and that's my pick of the week. All right, guys. God, are we at the end of the show already? Look at that. It just flies by every time. Martin, what do you, what do you have coming up? What's, what's coming up on your radar? Um, I, uh, I've got... The next thing that I'm doing is Greenland in August, um, and I was I was going to mention we we actually didn't this didn't sell very well for an, a number of reasons that I'm not going to go into now. But um, the we are taking a few people, so if anyone's interested in going on a very small group with two photographers, myself and Tim Falmer, um, then we, we it's like last call for Greenland. Um, it's August 25th. It's going to cost about I think it's at eight. Eight thousand six hundred or so dollars. It's not a cheap trip, um, but we actually start and finish in Iceland, and it includes the the, the journey, the travel over to Greenland. Um, so, if anyone's interested, check out uh, mbp.ac/greenland2016. Cool. Um, and I'm also I'm still trying to. We've got the uh, last three places on my Namibia 2017 trip. Um, but that's obviously we've got other stuff that uh, that you can see on my website. But um, that one we have to try and lock in on the numbers by the middle of next month. So if anyone's interested in going to Namibia for eight, I think it's 17 full days. Um, it's a great trip, an amazing place. So uh, check out that as well at mvp.ac/namibia. Excellent, excellent. And your podcast, of course, which is what what episode now are you on with the uh, with- <laughs> Mark Bailey photography I released episode 527 yesterday. So <laughs> we're coming up to 11 years old. If I'd have had a kid at that time, it'd have been like this big. It's just <laughs> silly. Yeah, yeah, that's crazy, man. That's congratulations, by the way. That is. Oh, thank you. It time flies, doesn't it? Time, yeah, time it sure just does. Dan, yeah. I think you need to start a podcast, man. See. I know it, that's a good idea. Yeah, why not? You got the voice. You can do it. Hello. All right, all right. Speaking of the voice, man, what do you have coming up? Um, not it's exciting actually. It's the <laughs> podcast of Greenland. Uh, I finally got around to redoing my website and was able to snag a killer domain. So I now own Dan Oh, nice. Uh, <laughs> nice. So got some new got some new stuff up there. Um, been stepping in some three D animations for manufacturing industrial clients, which includes some photography over at AGA Digital. So if anybody needs uh, some animations, give me a call. And then, uh, you know, working on some new training for our 3D garage site. Um, but also trying to build a new training site, and uh, I'm looking for a name. So oh. and once I once I get that all set up, I was supposed to be speaking at the Out of Chicago conference next week. Yeah, uh, which I will be there, by the way. Third time, but I had a conflict, so uh, so I had to bow out about two weeks ago. Because uh, I'm going to be teaching at uh, Notre Dame University. Again, oh. this summer. So it's about my sixth, sixth or seventh time out there. Dan, how does that happen? How does that happen? They're like every, almost every TWIP host is going to be there. We're going to be recording a live episode of TWIP at Out of Chicago. I'm going to yeah. be there. Valerie's going to be there. Derek's going to be there. On and on and on. I know. The one of us that lives in Chicago is not coming. <laughs> yeah, and one of the originals, <laughs> I have to say, because Chris. Uh, worked like 10 minutes from my studio and heard me on TWIP and came in one day and we got talking. He's like, I'm thinking about doing this conference. You think it would work? I'm like, yeah, I think it would work. And it was me and uh, Jamie Link and a few others. And well, you know, and this I was telling Martin, I said, now now they've got Frederick Van Johnson and Chris Orwig and, you know, so they don't need me. Yeah. <laughs> they got plenty. Yes, they do. But I'm going to miss, be my I'm first miss one. it, though, so. Well, hey, Hopefully you better... 
I'm going to be there for a week. You better find some time for oh, us I'll to be, have a I'll beer. I'll be back. Okay. Yeah. So maybe I'll, so let's definitely meet up then. No, oh, definitely. Definitely. Yeah. Cool, guys. Well, thank you both for coming on. Always a pleasure having you guys here. Sure. Um, as I mentioned throughout the show, yeah, so one of my one of my upcoming things is out of New York as well. So later this year, I'll be at the Out of New York conference, provided I don't, you know, get stage frighted out of Chicago. <laughs> They'll invite me. No, it's a good time. It's good people. Yeah, so it should be fun. Also, I'm going to Vietnam, uh, as you probably heard. Uh, we're inserting advertisements into this particular show promoting it, but I'm taking, I think we're maxing out at 11 people, which we may be close to that already. Um, taking 11 people for 11 days or 12 days to Vietnam, starting in um, northern Vietnam and making our way all the way down to Ho Chi Minh City, hanging out, taking photos, eating food, and enjoying Southeast Asia. So good way to spend a couple of weeks in your November, right? So nice. come hang out with us there. And the third thing is I'm really proud of this, guys. I'm really proud of it. We finally launched the TWIB School. The TWIB School is out. It's live to the world. And I'm, I've been giving updates on this like every show because this, I think we just passed, we're like well into the 3,000s nice. on student, students within, that are going through courses within the school. So, Excellent. yeah, I'm blown away. I'm blown away. It's, uh, it's been really good, and we've got a lot of big plans for the TWIP school. So please check it out before, you know, that Microsoft acquisition happens. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> please, please check out the TWIP school. Let us know what you think. Sign up for one of the courses. There's some free courses in there, as well as some paid courses. Uh, just you know, get in there, kick the tires, and and let me know what you think. All right, folks, we're at the end of another episode of This Week in Photo. Like I said, be sure to visit our school at twipschool.com. You can check out thisweekinphoto.com and subscribe to our other fantastic shows. And of course, follow us all on Twitter and Facebook, and if you're watching this on YouTube, be sure to comment, like, and subscribe. And with that, it's time to take that lens cap off.